Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever it is for you. Uh, my name is Bill Manis. I'm the Rescue Task Force Coordinator for Manitowoc County. Uh, this is part two of a training video for a Rescue Task Force. Um, the first part was mainly law enforcement uh, and a little incident command. Uh, part two and part three is for everybody. A um, couple things I'd like to mention. First of all, this video is not, is not for public viewing. Um, I think that sort of makes sense when you take a look at it. We're going to be talking about some tactics that we may use uh, in a rescue task force situation and it is not for public viewing. Uh, second thing I want to mention is you should always follow your policies and procedures. Uh, today I'm going to be talking mainly about alert training. So you just need to take it back a step and say, well, we do it this way. I'm trying to give you the generic approach of what we're expecting. Um, it all depends on what community you're in, but for the most part, we're gonna follow the same thing. So why do we do that? Well, it's a structure that we follow, so everybody remains safe, and it's a systematic approach, so things get done in a systematic order, and that way we're going to save some lives and be accountable for all of our rescue people that are out there. So, moving on, the objectives for RTF haven't changed. There's really two main objectives. The first one is stop the killing. That's law enforcement. That was part one. We talked about tactics um, for contact teams in part one. How are they going to eliminate the threat and eliminate it fast so we can accomplish objective number two, which is stop the dying. Now stop the dying, as I mentioned in part one to the law enforcement, that starts with them, okay? They have to get a secured corridor so RTFs can get in, and in the meantime, they have to tend to victims because they are going to make the difference between life and death and who survives and who doesn't. Once they've secured that corridor, we're going to start to move our RTF groups in. Okay. Last thing is clear and preserve the scene. That's going to be something that's going to take days, weeks, maybe even months. Okay. So big key thing in every incident that we have, any training drill that we have, we need to know the communication plan. And if you know the communication plan up front, that hopefully is going to solve some problems. So, Big one is law enforcement tactical channel. If it happens in the city of Two Rivers, the tactical channel is city of Two Rivers PD. If it happens in Manitowoc County, it's the sheriff's department, so on and so forth. That tactical channel is just for tactics on scene. Everything else gets moved off that channel, okay? For the rescue people, that would be EMS and fire. Our communication channel is gonna be county fire work one. Okay. That could change if the rescue group supervisor wants to move it to fire ground gold or fire ground red or something like that. But this is where we're going to start out and this is going to be our tactical work channel. Staging and everything else where you want to talk to dispatch, give your 23s. Um, staging channel is going to be County Fire Main. Why County Fire Main? It's the only radio channel everybody in the county has being law enforcement, DNR, fire, um, EMS, police, so on and so forth. So those are the main three frequencies that you need to know about. Who's on the tactical channels? Only people that are in the tactical operations part. Anything else goes to county fire main. Okay? All right, so where did we end? So we ended with contact teams going in in part one. Those are the people that are gonna go in there and stop the dying, okay? First thing they're gonna do is eliminate the threat. So, tactical group supervisor, okay? According to alert, okay, it's the fifth law enforcement officer that arrives on scene. They are gonna establish tactical group supervisor. What they're doing is they're saying stop. All other law enforcement that's arriving on scene you do not go into the incident. You're going to a staging area where you may become another contact team if needed, or you're going to be part of a rescue group, excuse me, rescue task force. Okay? So once this guy gets here, okay, or girl, 
They need to position themselves far enough away yet close enough. We don't want them right at the scene so they're in a warm zone. We want them actually in a cold zone. And what are they going to do? Well, they're going to say, hey, 556, five, whatever your unit number is to dispatch, I am going to be tactical group supervisor. I'm going to be located at XYZ. All other law enforcement units are going to go to the staging area, which is at ABC. Okay. I need the rescue group supervisor to meet me at my location. All communications not involved with tactical are going to go to county fire name. Okay. So then he's going to get a briefing from the inside crew. We call them contact teams. Okay. It's assumed command. He set the staging location. Okay. He said that he is going to be tactical command. Okay. And now contact one is going to get rid of their command option and move over to tactical group supervisor. Okay. So as he gets the briefing from the inside crew, he finds out what he needs. Whatever he needs, when he needs personnel or he needs equipment, all of that is going to come from staging. Okay? So he's done all of these things. Some of the other things that he needs to do is that next law enforcement officer that arrives in the staging area is going to need to assume staging manager. Okay? He's going to start thinking, okay, I need to get a soft perimeter around this area. He's going to verify that there's a rescue group supervisor that's going to be meeting him. And what I suggest in every incident, so you don't mess anything up, is we've developed these checklists in Manitowoc County. Okay? Step by step for what tactical group supervisor does, what rescue group supervisor does, plenty of room to write on. They're there, I would use them. Okay? So this is one of the handwritten ones that you can put in your pocket, you can have in your squad car, you can have in your fire truck, you can have in your ambulance. But it's all step-by-step -step things to do, okay? From the first arriving unit to what tactical group's going to do, okay? What rescue group's going to do, how we're going to go all the way through a transport group. Step-by-step -step instructions. This is uh, just an overview of the two sheets that I showed you, okay? Manitowoc Tactical Worksheet that we've put together as a group. Once again, the beginning part of that checklist is right here. Okay? Start assigning people of, so you know where people are. Okay? Who's in the staging area? What fire units are in the staging area? The back page is pretty well empty. You can do whatever you want with that. Okay? So, tactical group has been set up. It is a most important spot. You are the person that stops everybody else coming into that scene and creating chaos. Okay? You need to give adequate information to the dispatch center so they pass it on to the rest of the incoming units. Okay? All right, so everybody's stopped. We're all now going to staging at ABC, wherever that is. It's in a cold zone, usually pretty close to the scene, but not too close where a rifle could actually take out some responders. Okay? So what do we got set up? Right now we got a contact team that's inside the facility. They are stopping the killing or eliminating the threat, okay, and then they're gonna start stopping the dying. Tactical group supervisor is now assumed command, and we've got another law enforcement officer that's starting to set up staging on the law enforcement side. Okay. So that staging officer is gonna log all of the incoming units that are coming in. As those law enforcement units are coming in, they need to gear up, be ready to go, bring their go bags forward so everything's right there ready to go. Okay, and if you're going to be a contact team, you need to figure out how am I going to get to the scene? Am I going to hop in a bearcat? Am I going to hop in an ambulance and get a ride there? Am I going to take a squad car? Am I going to take a pickup truck? You need to know that before you're needed, okay, how you're going to get there. Okay? So, we've got the staging manager that's set up over here. They may need a liaison, okay? a person to help them. Same thing here with tactical. It's going to get rather hairy for a while, so it may be nice to have a liaison with you. So, if you think you need one, you call over to staging and say, hey, send me one more person to be dropped off at my vehicle. 
I would like to have another person here to help me. Okay? So rescue group, they now know where to go. They're going to meet up with tactical group supervisor. Who usually fills this spot? Well, it's usually the first officer from the jurisdiction that arrives. Okay? Let's say it's a fire engine. That fire engine pulls up to the tactical group supervisor, drops off that officer. That officer, once again, wants a liaison. There, maybe they'll grab a liaison from that fire engine, and now that fire engine is going to head towards staging. Okay? Probably the driver of that fire engine is now going to become the rescue group staging manager. So we also have law enforcement and rescue working together. Now, for the rescue people or the fire people in particular, we work with staging all the time. We may need to give help a little bit to law enforcement work together. Okay. So. Once the rescue group supervisor arrives on scene, okay, meets up with tactical, needs to get a, a report. What's going on? Okay, they've already co-located. Hopefully, it's a big enough vehicle where you both can sit inside. If not, we want you right over there where the tactical group supervisor is sitting, so you guys are within face-to-face -face distance to make decisions. Okay, um, your job. Okay, is to request additional rescue personnel as needed. Remember with Mavis, we've got life safety cards. You may even have an active shooter card. Uh, think about what you need. Make sure you take the resources off your engine when you get dropped off. Okay? You're going to be assigned the rescue group supervisor. Think about things that you're going to need. We're going to need to move patients. Okay? At all of our other drills, we've always stopped once we got to an ambulance exchange point. With the drill that's coming up in May, we are actually going to take it one step further. Okay? We are actually going to move patients off the scene through an ambulance exchange point, through a transportation officer, to a treatment area. Okay? So you're going to need somebody to take care of the transportation group, somebody to take care of a treatment group. Once again, use the checklist. They're there to help you. Okay? Mavis Division 128 has put together this tactical worksheet. Two sides to it. Okay, once again, we're worried about keeping track of who's where. So who does that? Okay. So the staging area manager is the perfect person to do that because he's going to get the requests for people and know where they're going to. They're not going to leave staging until they know what their tasks, their function, and their radio channel is going to be. So this is a great place where the staging area manager can start to fill these areas up. Okay? As we move on into the incident, if you turn the form over, okay, there's some mass casualty stuff. Again, some more checklists to take care of. Where are patients going to? Who can take what? So on and so forth. So when's the best time to get familiar with these worksheets? Not necessarily when the incident has taken place, but during the winter months, Okay, when you guys are looking for things that you can do for training, pull these out. Put together a tabletop drill. Contact me. I'll come out to your department. We can do some internal training. It's just so you're prepared so when this happens, it's not the first time you're taking a look at these things. So, what do we got set up right now? So, we got a contact team in there, second contact team that's at the incident. This HB, okay. In part one, I talked about the importance of a hall boss. This is the person that's the traffic cop inside the incident. So when the rescue task force or other contact teams show up at the incident, that hall boss is going to meet them wherever they say that they need them and give them a job and show them where to go. So they're meeting them as they go in. What does that do? That avoids the inside people not knowing where other people are coming and possibly getting shot at. Okay. We've got the two rescue and law enforcement together now with the tactical group supervisor, rescue group supervisor, co-located. We've got staging area set up. We've got two staging managers, one for fire, one for law, maybe some liaisons to help them out. That's where our incident is. So for the purpose of this video, I'd just like to go back to some of the training that we had. I'm going to use Silver Lake College or Holy Family College, and I'm just going to use that uh, to be a reference point. Okay, so Silver Lake College, they're in the dorm area over here. They're trying to eliminate the threat. Okay, the shooter's there. 
these two people, Safe Place, Silver Creek Fire Station, staging area set maybe over at AmeriCollect, okay, just to give you an idea of where things may be set up. So, we've got all this stuff set up. We've got the law enforcement and the rescue. We've got a staging area. Now, once we start to arrive, especially the rescue people, we need to go in and report to that manager, but we're going to be bringing gear forward. So what type of gear is going to be important to bring forward? Well, all of the ambulances in Manitowoc County have got Rescue Task Force tactical vests. Okay? They also got tactical helmets. Okay? The ambulances aren't going to need these, okay? but the people that are going to be going in that are forming the Rescue Task Force, which are usually going to be firemen, hopefully with some medical training. Okay? Also, all ambulances now have got a tactical medical bay. Okay? That's going to go forward. Every public safety vehicle in Manitowoc County has got one of these. Okay? More medical equipment. There's tourniquets inside here. There's bandages inside here. Once again, get familiar with this stuff. All right. So, on the rescue side, that first rescue task force that's going to go in it's probably going to be a treat, move, treat. So what does that mean? Okay. So it's usually made up of at least two rescue people. It may be four, but it's always got a minimum of two cops. Okay. One law enforcement person in front, one law enforcement in back, and their job is to protect that group. Law enforcement's got complete veto power, so if we're moving towards something and they hear on their radio end that something's going to happen, They've got the ability to back rescue off, take them to a safe spot. What we need to remember on the rescue side is this is a law enforcement incident. Okay? They're going to be guiding us. We're going to be able to talk to them. Okay? We're going to be able to come up to a plan together, but always remember it's a law enforcement incident. All right, so this first group is going to maneuver their way through the incident checking to make sure that the law enforcement people have put tourniquets on, pack wounds, if there's a chest seal that needs to be put on. We're going to reevaluate those things and we're going to take patients red or yellow. Green patients are walking patients, we're going to safely remove them from the scene, but the people that are going to be left are either going to be yellow or red. Okay? And the goal is no more than a minute at each patient. Okay? When we leave that patient, we put them in a recovery position. Okay? The next group that's going to come in based on the scenario is going to be a group here uh, made up of RTF. Once again, either two or four rescue people, but with a minimum of two cops, okay, their job is to evacuate. They're going to be moving people either to what's called a casualty collection point, a safe spot inside the structure, or they may be moving them directly to an ambulance exchange point where the ambulance is going to take them to either a hospital or a treatment area. Okay. All right, so rescue task force. Assemble team and equipment in the staging area. So you saw some of the things. You want to move all of that stuff forward, and you want to have mega movers also. Anything that you think you might need at that scene. The next thing you need to start thinking about is you're going to be moving four or six people from a staging area to the incident. How are you going to get there? Are you going to take separate vehicles? We want to keep you together as a team. So the answer there should be no. Okay? Are we going to take a cot out of an ambulance and are we going to move you guys all the way up to the scene in an ambulance and then that ambulance leaves? Okay? Are we going to move you in an SUV that's large enough to get four to six people in? It's going to be in the back of a pickup truck. Okay? It's going to be in a Bearcat. You guys in the rescue staging area need to figure that out before rescue group supervisor says, send me rescue task force. Right? So you need to be ready to go. You need to know where the equipment is so you can grab it and go. So what are some things we're going to drop at that uh, equipment drop in the staging area? Well, ballistics, helmets, and vests. All of the incoming ambulances, like I said, have them. They're not going to need them. Okay? It's going to be the rescue task force people that go in. Now the one thing that I want to stress here, which I've stressed in other videos, is that equipment is not mandatory. It's available if you want to wear it. 
you should be in a safe area. It's going to be warm, you're going to be protected by cops, but it's there if you want it. Once again, contact your local ambulance person so you can see what that equipment looks like. How do you size it? How do you fit it? What's all on it? Okay. Um, LEO and rescue bags. Okay. Like I said, these green bags here, every public safety vehicle should be readily placed in a staging equipment area so as soon as you're called, you can grab a go bag or maybe this go bag or mega movers. Okay. You're going to need all of those things once you get inside. Okay. Um, you may have triage bags on your engine or on your first responder vehicle. Mega movers we've already talked about. Rover kits. Once again, every ambulance in Manitowoc County has got a rover kit. They just need to remember to bring it to a mass casualty incident. It's not on every rig. Okay. Extra portable radios you might need. So if you've got extra portable radios in your ambulance, bring them to the cache. Uh, for law enforcement, your weapons and all your extra ammo, your go bags. Okay, so you're ready to rock and roll. So it's getting rather busy here now. So inside the structure, we've got contact team one, which was the first team that's in there. We've got a command person, which we call a hall boss, which controls where everybody goes once they get there. We've got a second contact team. Hopefully they're securing that corridor and starting to apply medical uh, attention to people. We've got a staging area that's starting to fill up, equipment that's starting to be dropped. Rescue group and tactical group are all together. Okay? And now we've sent in a Rescue Task Force 1 to do a treat, move, treat, and a Rescue Task Force 2 to do an evacuation. Okay? So just to go over hot, warm, and cold zones, for the most part, when the contact teams go in, and there's still a subject at large, it's a hot zone, okay? Teams are gonna enter, they're gonna neutralize the threat, then they're gonna start to provide medical care and set up a safety corridor. Now it becomes warm zone, okay? This is where the rescue task force can go in. They can triage, treat, and evacuate injured persons. Cold zones, usually the staging area or outside a certain perimeter, okay? So, how do things take place from the scene to the rescue group supervisor out to staging? So, if law enforcement needs something, let's say they need another contact team, they're going to call to tactical group supervisor and say, hey, I need another contact team at door A, meet hall boss there to help set up a safety corridor, maybe an ambulance exchange point. Okay? These two guys talk. Okay? Tactical group calls out to his staging manager and says, I need a contact team to go to door A, meet the hall boss. You're going to be in charge of X, Y, Z. They say 10-4, and now it takes place. Once again, you need to be ready once you're asked for in that staging area. Okay? So here's what it looks like at Silver Lake College. Here's the incident here at the door. Okay, they call out the tactical group supervisor which is sitting over here at the fire station at Silver Creek. They call out to the stage manager, say I need this, and then it arrives. So that's how it works. Now, if it is something where it is a rescue thing, where rescue says, hey, I need some more mega movers, or I need another rescue task force, it happens just the same way. Okay? They call from the inside, but they're not calling to the, to, the, to the tactical group supervisor, they're calling to the rescue group supervisor because it's rescue related. I need another rescue task force. So what happens is they call, it goes here, and then they go to staging. Okay. So once again, the radio communication model. Law enforcement, whatever jurisdiction you're on, it's the primary radio frequency for law enforcement. Okay. For rescue, County Fire Work 1 is our tactical, unless it's changed by rescue group supervisor. And then staging and everything else is on County Fire Main. All right, so we're back to our contact teams. What have they done? Well, they've stopped the shooter so far. They've taken steps in combat shooting and tactical plan. 
They've either secured the shooter or determined that the shooter is no longer on scene. And their transition now has gone from stopping the killing, which they've eliminated the threat, to stopping the dying. So they're starting to apply medical attention to the injured victims. They're starting to set up a safety corridor. They've established one person to be in charge. Once again, key person. Anybody that goes into the incident from staging is going to be looking for that hall boss. Okay? They've also given vital information on to dispatch who's monitoring those frequencies. We're not chasing ghosts. We're not doing a room by room looking for that person. Okay? We need to get rescue people in there. Um, so we've set up that safety corridor and we've started calling for rescue group people to arrive. Before they get there, okay, remember SIM for law enforcement, okay? We're going to have some type of a security plan, a hall boss, maybe a room boss. What's your immediate action plan? And we're going to deal with medical. So we got patients, okay, that are here and here. We got two patients in room 101, one in room, one, room 102. What can we do to make it a better thing? Well, we can move this patient over here. Now all three patients are in a single room that's being protected by law enforcement. Okay? And we can make one of these guys a room boss. So what does it look like? We move the patients over. We don't have to worry too much anymore about room 102. We've got the hallway protected. We've got a person in charge here that's providing medical care. And we've set up now our first casualty collection point. Where are we moving patients to that they can be safely protected get medical attention before we can get the ambulances in there. All right, so that's what it looked like. So I talked a little bit about Rescue Task Force, different configurations, okay? Most of the time, we're in this configuration. Law enforcement in front, minimum of two rescue people here, <clears throat> law enforcement in back, the two blue guys or the law enforcement people are on their tactical frequency. The red people are on their frequency. One person from each group is in charge to be the radio person. Okay? Once you form this configuration, whatever it is, you guys stay together in a group until you're back at staging. Okay? No breaking up the teams. All right, staging managers. So let's talk a little bit about the staging area. Once again, fire and rescue guys help the law guys. We do staging a lot. Law very rarely does any type of staging. Okay? So check in the people as they get there. I don't care if you use those checklists, if you just use a blank piece of paper, put law enforcement on one side, rescue on another side, and then your ambulances on another. Hopefully by now, rescue and tactical have called out the staging and said, hey, this is the minimum number of people I want you to keep in staging at all times. And then it's up to you to do that. You call back to dispatch to get more resources. Um, and that's your job. So prioritize assignments as directed by the supervisors. Maintain that minimum resources that I talked to you about. Okay? And you guys need to work together. Uh, one thing that Brown County has done in their staging area is they've got law enforcement on one side, rescue on another. They're close enough, but then you can see the people. Because you might not be familiar with everybody that's showing up. You might get people from State Patrol. You might get people from DNR. You might get people from Sheboygan Fire. Okay? So try to keep rescue on one side, law on one side. That works for them. Okay? So here's just an idea here. We've got law enforcement all written down of who's in the staging area. we got all the rescue people that are in the staging area here, and we've got ambulances. So they call out to uh, staging area and say, hey, I need a second contact team. Staging manager circles three people, okay, tells them to go to door A, meet up with the hall boss. These guys are done. They've already been assigned. Now they need an RTF. Well, we need a minimum of two cops, so these two cops are going to pair up with engine 111. Boom, they're gone. Right? Need a second RTF. Once again, at least a minimum of two cops. Here we've got three, and we got engine 121 that's going to be going. Boom, they're gone. Boy, they need a little bit more help with contact teams in there now. Okay? So they got four more cops that have been assigned to that area, um, and they moved. 
we need some hard perimeter that's going to be set up. So we've got two engines now that are going to be setting up perimeter to that incident. So this is just a simple way you can make a staging worksheet and you can make it work. Okay? As the ambulances are called up, just move them to the area. So key things once again, and I've stressed this a couple times, know your communication channels. Okay? Um, and know the two main objectives. Law enforcement, stop the killing. You're going to eliminate the threat. Once you've eliminated the threat, you need to start tending to victims and stop the dying until you can get a safety corridor and get those RTFs in. Okay? Once the RTFs are in, uh, we're going to set up a casualty collection point. Or we may just need an ambulance exchange point. That's a place where law enforcement needs to protect, where ambulances are going to come in one by one and take patients out of the incident, either to local or regional hospitals, or maybe even to a treatment area. Okay. Before you leave staging, make sure you know your task and function. Once you get to the incident, look for the hall boss. They will direct you. Okay. And like I said, know the radio frequencies you're supposed to be on. So why all of this? Okay, We know incident command works. If we'd send everybody to the scene, we may have, how are the cops going to know who's the good guys, who's the bad guys? Okay? How are we going to manage the scene with everybody going in different directions? That's why we need to set this up. We need to set it up from the beginning and we can't have people rushing in and not following your policies and procedures. So what does it look like? Okay, so tactical group is set up here. It's an operations level. Okay, might have some contact teams. Rescue group, once again, an operational level. Okay, intelligence is gonna happen later, but as the incident grows, we're gonna have Command post that's probably going to show up, or we're going to have um, multi jurisdiction people in the incident command post. We're going to have the safety people that are already watching over the scene now. We're going to have plenty of liaisons. Probably going to have to set up a joint information center. Right? Incident command is going to be multi jurisdictional. But that's just what an initial fixed command is going to look like anytime that we have got an active assailant. Now, most of the time we talk about active shooters. Could this be a bombing? It could be. Could it be something similar like what happened in Canada where you had a guy with a machete and knives? It definitely could be. Once again, we have to have control of the scene. We can't have everybody rushing in. We need to do this safely, okay, and be able to move patients and get them to a good place where they need to get medical care in the end. <clears throat> so, tactical group and rescue group, how do you keep track of this stuff? Well, you may have a liaison that takes notes. Here's just a, a general guideline on a piece of paper. If you want to use this, you can, okay? So, threats, responders, casualties, victims. As those contact teams are going in and they're giving you reports, you're gonna write down some things. Well, we know it's a single white male, okay? He's in his early 20s. He's got only a handgun, okay? Who's in there right now? Well, we got contact team one. Contact team one needs another contact team, so now we know we got contact teams two in there. We need rescue task force. Where are the victims, okay? Casualties, how many reds, how many blacks, how many yellows, so on and so forth. Rescue group can do the exact same thing. Responders, zones, ambulance exchange points, casualty collection points. So, where did Rescue Task Force go in? They went on A side, they're in the gym. Okay? Rescue Task Force 2 is going to be moving patients to the casualty collection point. They may be in the gym. Okay? Casualty collection point, you're going to enter main door, side A, look for that hall boss. Okay? Ambulance exchange point, side A, right by the casualty collection point. So the big question that I always pose to everybody, and it's something to think about, is how many patients can Manitowoc hospitals handle? We are level three trauma centers. For the most part, we've got one surgeon that's on duty, we got one ER doc that's on duty. We may have a hospitalist, there may be three docs in each one of the facilities. 
We got a minimum number of staff to take care of day-to-day -day activities. Okay? We've got one OR team that's on call. Excuse me, that's on call. Okay, so we can't handle a lot of patients, so we need to start thinking outside the box early. If it's good weather, can we get helicopters? Okay. We need to have dispatch send out an alert, maybe to find out what other hospitals and how many people they can handle. So, there is a program within the state of Wisconsin that's called the M Resource. Dispatch Center can get a hold of our regional coordinator, available by phone 24-7. They can put out a message, okay? This is a drill, okay? Manitowoc County's got eight red, 10 yellow, seven greens, okay? What can you handle right now? So these are the hospitals that are in our region. This is how many reds they can handle, how many yellows they can handle, how many greens they can handle. Now, as the incident changes, these numbers will change too, okay? So it's something that can be viewed via the internet. Hopefully our dispatch center in the near future will have that so they can take a look at it. All hospitals have it also. So, we may not be able to get everybody to the Manitowoc hospitals. Okay? We may set up a treatment center off-site in a cold zone. So here's just an example. Uh, unfortunately, there's certain things that deal when we're setting up treatment areas. Okay? And so this one's outside. In Wisconsin, we get all different kinds of weather. We want to keep trauma patients warm. Okay? So we need to pick a location where we can do that. Do we have enough resources that we can man a treatment center? Is there ease of access for the ambulances to get in and to get out? Helicopters to land safely. Okay, another big thing is they're gonna have to be guarded, okay? So we need to set up security there. Um, transport logs. Um, when we had the tornado in St. Nazian's, we transported, I think, 17 people out of there. Okay? We had loved ones that were coming to the command post and saying, where did my loved one go? So whoever that transportation officer is, I don't want you only to know what ambulances went where. If you can write down a name, if, it, if at all possible, that will just help relocate people to the appropriate hospital because if I call up on the phone and say, hey, is my loved one there? they're probably not going to tell me yes or no. Okay. So, know where the ambulance have taken the patients, how many patients have gone, and if you can get patient names, okay, all the better. So, if you've got any questions, I can be uh, gotten through Manitowoc County Dispatch. I'm not available 24-7. If you'd like me to come out to your organization, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, part three is uh, medical care. That's going to be coming up. Um, I hope you understand the information that I've given you so far and how important it is. Um, but remember, we can't all arrive on the scene. It needs to be done systematically. That's how we're going to save lives. That's how we're going to be accountable to each other. And that's how we make it safe for everybody that responds. So thank you. This is the end of part two. And part three will follow shortly.